The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Ventilator Waveforms by Craig Smallwood My name is Craig Smallwood. I'm a respiratory therapist here at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm going to review some ventilator waveforms with you. Kind of what I'd like to review are some normal waveforms. I'm going to orient you to the ventilator graphic screen interface. And we're going to go over some normal waveforms in pressure control and volume control and pressure support. After that, we're going to click to some, uh, some common errors or problems or issues that you may see. Uh, this is not going to be all encompassing, but just give you a little bit of a primer on ventilator waveforms. Basic Concepts If you're not familiar with ventilator waveforms and graphics, I encourage you to look at them and look at them often. There's a terrible amount of information that you can glean from just simply looking at the screen of the ventilator when a patient is being mechanically ventilated. Each three of these waveforms that I've highlighted to you now um, have a different horizontal axis depending on which you're looking at. For pressure, it's going to be in centimeters water, a unit of pressure. For flow, typically is displayed in liters per minute. We have a positive and a negative. And then finally, the volume is just a, a volume unit, either mLs or liters. On the horizontal axis, typically is displayed in seconds, and you can adjust this to display more or fewer breaths depending on how much information you have set to display in the time. Pressure control. Let's take a closer look at the pressure waveform. Now, a normal waveform is going to depend on your mode of ventilation. For the purposes of the next few moments, I'm going to talk briefly about pressure controlled ventilation. Now simply looking at the pressure waveform, we can glean a pretty good amount of information about how the ventilator has been set. We can look at the positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, and that's indicated here as the lowest pressure on the pressure waveform. You should note that now it's set to 5 centimeters of water, and it should really never get to zero because typically on a ventilator we will set at least 5 or more centimeters of water for PEEP. When the ventilator cycles into inspiration, you can see that indicated by red here. Um, we reach a peak inspiratory pressure of 20 centimeters of water. Furthermore, we can uh, look at the time scale and the time between the beginning and the end of inspiration and calculate the inspiratory time that we have set on the ventilator during this mode of ventilation. So you can see by looking at the pressure waveform that the waveform is very rigid and box-like. Basically, the variable that you're going to be controlling, in this case it's pressure, is going to be controlled by the ventilator and it's going to have this kind of feel to it. The other waveforms, the flow and volume, will look slightly more organic and that's because they're going to be dependent upon the patient's compliance and the airway's resistance and they're basically going to be a variable that's not controlled. Moving along then to the flow waveform, you can see that we start at zero flow, so there's no gas exchange occurring at this point in time. When the ventilator cycles into inspiration, you'll have a sharp increase in the flow up to about 7.5 liters a minute here in our patient, and then it'll kind of gradually decrease as time goes on through inspiration. Now this point here is uh, what we refer to as like an inspiratory plateau, where you can see that the inspiratory pressure is still on, but there's a small period of time when there's zero flow. This can be an important component, and we'll talk about that more in detail later. Now the ventilator is cycling into expiration and we again see a sharp increase in the flow or decrease rather because we're looking at a negative flow and the breath is exhaled um, and then the flow rate will gradually deteriorate until the whole breath is uh, exhaled at about this point and then we have you know zero flow from this period of time to this period of time when the next breath cycles. Looking at the volume waveform you'll see that we start at zero ml and will increase um, gradually, kind of in this curved nature, up to the peak volume that's going to be delivered. Here we're looking at about 80 mLs um, of tidal volume. And then the ventilator will cycle into expiration and the breath will be exhaled and the volume waveform will gradually deteriorate back to zero. I encourage you to study uh, normal ventilator waveforms in pressure control and volume control and pressure support ventilation. This will help you to have a solid understanding of what is normal 
so that when an abnormality arises in patients who have some sort of condition, you'll be able to quickly identify it. Having this kind of understanding and being able to identify this quickly at the bedside will help you treat your patients better. Volume control. Now I'm going to talk about what is a normal volume control waveform. There are, there are a couple different ones, so you'll see on the screen I've represented two here. Uh, these, are, these are the most typical of what you may see. There may be a couple different ones um, that I'm not going to talk about here that you can certainly look up on your own time. In the, on the left part of the waveform here, we have uh, what we would call a square waveform. You can see on the flow, because we're controlling the, the inspiratory flow basically here in volume control, that it has a very box-like structure. Um, the, other, the other type of waveform that you may see is a decelerating waveflow. And it looks a little bit more like pressure control, but you can still see that it's very box-like and controlled. Um, there's no real difference in why one of these may be beneficial over the others, um, but it's just depending on what your ventilator has and what you may be comfortable with. Now we're going to start in the pressure waveform. Because we are controlling flow, um, you'll see that the pressure is variable and has kind of a little, little bit of an organic sense to it, and you can see this in the curvature from the peep until the peak inspiratory pressure. In the square waveform breath here, you'll see that this peak kind of is reached almost, almost linearly, and that's because the, the flow is constant throughout the breath. Um, the peak pressure that you'll uh, identify for patients to be able to figure out compliance is going to be the pressure that is identified here at the end of the breath. Now when we look at the flow waveform in the square uh, waveform pattern, you'll see that we start inspiration, the flow stays at what is set on the ventilator, and remains so until the end of the breath where it cycles into exhalation. The exhalation is very similar to the pressure control in that you have a big spike or a uh, big flow of gas outside of the patient and then gradually deteriorates until there's hopefully a little bit of a pause between the next breath. In the volume waveform, you'll see that we steadily increased linearly from zero to our total tidal volume here at the end of the breath, and that's because the flow is constant. And then we exhale and return to zero. In the decelerating waveform pattern in volume control, you'll see that it looks more similar to the pressure control, but it's still quite different. We can identify those differences fairly easily. On the pressure waveform, you'll see that we rise from the peep pressure here up until the peak pressure at the end of the breath. Um, a little bit more of a curve pattern can be identified here in the waveform. In the flow, and this is how we can tell that it's volume control and how we can identify that it's in a decelerating wave flow pattern here, we see that we start the breath with a sharp increase in the flow, and then it kind of gradually deteriorates until we reach the end of the breath, and then we cycle into exhalation. This pattern here between the peak flow at the beginning of the breath and the flow at the end is going to be something that's controlled by the inner workings of the ventilator. The volume is very similar to a pressure control waveform in that we start at zero, we're going to gradually increase until we reach almost the peak volume here, and then we cycle into exhalation. Another note about volume control is the plateau pressure or inspiratory pause maneuver. Um, if we were to do one of these, we'd basically want to, to pause the pressure that we have at end inspiration here, and then the flow would reach zero, and then we'd be able to identify the applied pressure to the alveoli in the lungs. Pressure support. Now we come to the third main category of ventilation mode that we're going to discuss here, pressure support ventilation. Again, this is a spontaneous mode and requires spontaneous inspiratory effort of the patient. Pressure support is a spontaneously triggered and spontaneously cycled mode of ventilation. Let's look at the waveforms. We can see in the pressure waveform that we're controlling pressure here in pressure support ventilation. You can identify the square pattern here and know that we're controlling pressure. A couple key components here, you'll see that um, firstly the ventilator has identified this breath to be spontaneously triggered and some may represent this different but our ventilators here at Boston Children's give us a nice yellow waveform indicating that there was a spontaneous trigger or effort from the patient that initiated this breath. 
The trigger can also be identified by the slight dip in the pressure waveform, and that's because the, pre the pressure is generated uh, by the diaphragm or the intercostal muscles of the patient, and we have a little bit of a, a negative deflection of the pressure waveform. Sometimes you may see in the flow waveform too a little, a little slight dip, and that could be a patient effort as well. The inspiratory time is variable during pressure support and may, may depend upon your patient's effort. We're going to skip along to the flow waveform here and, talk and discuss at length how the, the ventilator cycles off or determines how long the breath should be. Again, the, the breath is started by either a flow or pressure trigger, which is chosen by the clinician, and that'll begin here. The peak flow will be reached very early in the breath, and we kind of have this characteristic um, decrease or deteriorating uh, flow pattern that we see in pressure control until we reach a point where the, the vent determines that exhalation should occur. Determining this point here is very critical to understanding how pressure support works and also identifying the appropriate application of the mode. Exhalation is determined by looking at the peak flow, which here I'm just going to call 10 to make it easy math, and the ventilator is going to take a predetermined percentage of that peak flow uh, to trigger it to go into exhalation. So if our exhalation trigger was set at 30% and our inspiratory flow was 10 liters per minute, once the flow deteriorated to a point where it reached 3 liters per minute, the ventilator would be triggered into cycling to exhalation and the inspiratory portion of the breath would end. And you can see that can ha that's happened here in our patient. And we cycle into exhalation and the breath is exhaled. The volume waveform is very similar to pressure control in that we rise from zero up to our tidal volume here and the breath is exhaled again. Variable flow exhalation. The next few moments I'm going to spend with you are identifying uh, common errors or problems that may arise and you can identify by it, looking at the ventilator waveforms. You can see in the, in the waveform here that we're in a pressure controlled mode because we're, we have very rectangular and controlled pressure variables here. Um, you'd also be able to see that this patient's on 20 centimeters of water over 5 centimeters of water. And if we knew the time scale, we could figure out the inspiratory time and the total rate. Um, but what I want to focus most of my attention on here is the, uh, the abnormality here that we've identified in the exhalation portion of the breath. If you recall what a, what a normal pressure control exhalation or volume control exhalation looks like, it looks a lot more smooth. So because we have kind of a jagged or a variable flow exhalation here, it tells us something's going wrong with exhalation on the ventilator. This could be caused by a couple of different things. It could be uh, some sort of obstruction. This can be as simple as secretions or an anatomic abnormality, or it could be something mechanical inside the ventilator that's malfunctioned as well. Typically though, um, this problem's gonna be secretions and it's just going to be something kind of blogging up the end of the tube that's going to disrupt the smooth waveform flow pattern that we want to see by kind of getting in the way and then kind of moving a little bit as the patient exhales. Um, I advise you to take caution in identifying stuff like this as there can be several causes, but I always like to start with the simplest solution first and then work through it. So the solution here would be to listen to the patient if it sounds like the kid needs to be suctioned, then you apply some suction and hopefully when you put the patient back on the ventilator, this abnormality will be resolved. Airflow obstruction. The next, uh, the next abnormality that I'm going to review is commonly seen and takes careful attention from the clinician in order to alleviate or treat the condition as appropriate. Again, we can see exercising our um, ability to identify the mode from looking at the waveforms. We're in pressure control here, and again, the kid's on 20 over five. If you'll, if you'll think back to what we expect this waveform to look like, you'll see that there are abnormalities with both the flow and the volume waveform. One, one big difference here is at end inspiration, we're not reaching zero flow. Remember, if you have an appropriate inspiratory time, this flow should uh, decrease until you get to about zero just before exhalation occurs. 
Now, because we haven't reached that, not, or not even close here, tells us something about the condition of the patient. We can also look at the uh, exhalation portion of the breath. As we come down here on the flow, we don't reach zero either. What this tells us is that there is some obstruction inside the patient that's preventing adequate airflow in and out of the patient. Again, this can occur for a couple different reasons. It can be as simple as uh, bronchospasm, which may be treated with some bronchodilator. It could be caused by, again, some sort of anatomic or mechanical obstruction. It could be secretions. Um, it could also be an inappropriately small endotracheal tube, which would need to be adjusted. But in all cases, uh, we identify a big problem on the ventilator waveform, and then we're required to look at the patient and carefully identify what we think is causing the obstruction. Another thing to carefully consider when you're identifying obstruction is whether or not the rate is too high. There is an occurrence what we refer to as breath stacking, whereby the clinician has increased the respiratory rate so high that the portion of expiratory time is not long enough to allow a complete exhalation of the breath. In this case, it may be appropriate to decrease the rate slightly, maybe increase your tidal volume to compensate. Again, I encourage you to identify uh, variables in the patient, breath sounds, vital signs, also the condition or known history of the patient before coming up with the diagnosis. Trigger sensitivity. These next two slides that I'm going to share with you refer to trigger sensitivity. Triggering on the ventilator is determined by either a flow or pressure trigger. These are both set by the clinician and should be identified anytime you look at the ventilator to make sure that your patient doesn't have to try too hard to trigger the ventilator and cause increased work of breathing or possibly missed breaths or set too insensitively that the ventilator continuously auto cycles and causes great distress with the patient. Let's look at the waveforms. On this first image, you can see right away in the pressure and flow and volume waveform that there's something going on here that's, uh, that's not typical. And the pressure here, as we go along, you can see we're at peak and expiratory pressure, and then we have this little dip. And with this dip, we have a little bit of an increase in flow, so that's telling us that there is some sort of flow going into the patient or at least delivered by the ventilator. And then you can see we have a little bit of a volume change as well. Now this would, this would indicate to you that the patient is breathing, whereby we have a negative deflection in pressure to somewhere below PEEP, but the, bre the breath is not identified as such by the ventilator. You can quickly look at the patient and see if they are indeed triggering by um, carefully assessing the diaphragm or intercostal muscles, and then also looking at the trigger sensitivity values on your ventilator. You can see here that as we go through the respiratory cycle, the ventilator is set to some sort of rate and a mandatory breath is delivered. So now that we've identified by looking at the pressure and flow waveform that the patient is making at least small inspiratory efforts, we have to turn to our trigger sensitivity values set on the ventilator and decrease them slightly. I encourage you to do this incrementally and allow for several breaths to be um, breathed in by the patient to identify the optimal level. Auto cycling. So you can see here that we have a couple of things going on. One, right off the bat, you can tell that the ratio between the inspiratory time and the expiratory time is very small. Second, we can see that the ventilator has determined that these breaths are spontaneously triggered, whereby they're yellow. And we can see these little bumps or disruptions in the peak and expiratory pressure and flow waveforms here that we wouldn't normally expect to see. Now, there are, uh, there are several different ways that autocycling, uh, defined by the ventilator cycling into inspiration when it's not triggered by the patient, can present itself, and this is just one of many. Oftentimes, you'll see just a huge mess of ventilator graphic um, that don't make any sense, and you can quickly identify whether or not this is autocycling by looking at whether or not the patient looks like they're making inspiratory efforts with uh, their diaphragm, or by assessing the trigger sensitivity values on the ventilator. This one here um, is, a, is a good one to identify because it's very common. The, the slight oscillations here, they often correspond exactly to the patient's heart rate. Now, because the heart is sitting right next to the airway and the lungs, it can, when contracting hard enough, cause 
mild oscillations in flow and pressure on the ventilator. If the trigger value on the vent is set too sensitively, these small oscillations in flow or pressure can cause auto-triggering on the ventilator. The best solution in this case would be to decrease the sensitivity slightly on the ventilator and then assess to make sure that it's not too insensitive that the patient can't trigger a breath. Ventilator leaks. Lastly, we come to um, one of the most common abnormalities that you'll identify with uh, inspecting ventilator waveforms and one that you should be able to do so instantaneously when assessing patients at the bedside. Starting at the top, we see that the pressure waveform looks normal. The flow waveform appears normal. And now we come to the volume waveform and we can identify here, especially in the expiratory portion of the breath, that it's not coming back to baseline or not returning to zero. What this tells us is that the breath is inspired here, and we see that our tidal volume is around 80 mLs. Now when we're exhaling, not all 80 mLs is measured by the ventilator. This, can, this indicates a leak. Now a leak can be caused by many different things, including endotracheal tube leaks, if you have a cuff tube, or even a cuffless tube. Assess the endotracheal tube leak by auscultating the lateral neck. The solution there would be easy to inflate the cuff a little bit and assess the volume waveform. Or it can also be caused by mechanical leaks in the circuit or even a, a ventilator malfunction. This concludes the lecture on ventilator waveforms. Again, I encourage you to inspect uh, ventilator waveforms, especially in normal children, often so that when you're presented with abnormalities in children who need your expertise, you'll be able to quickly and accurately identify issues that can be resolved in no time at all. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.